Verde, your weekly KPFA environmental public affairs radio show. I am your host today, Gary Hughes, y los queremos ofrecer un bienvenido muy especial. Welcome to a very special show. The fact is that Terra Verde over this past year has proven to be an excellent and creative platform through which I've been able to share with KPFA listeners a series of shows delving into current events in Chile. On this show today, I am very excited to have as a guest a doctoral student from UC Davis who has a very exciting line of research that strongly affirms the analysis by which I have chosen to work so hard personally and professionally, including through the production of radio shows for KPFA on these climate justice and human rights matters that connect us in California with our friends and partners in Chile. The fact is that there are deep historical and contemporary ties between California and Chile. And with our guest today, Cynthia Ammerman, we are going to learn more about these ties that bind Chile and California together. As listeners have gathered from other episodes of Terra Verde in the past year, in which we have tapped into topics related to human rights and climate justice in this unique South American nation, We believe that Chile is a particularly exciting topic for Terra Verde on KPFA because of the immediacy of the moment in Chile and how much the Chilean despertar, that is, the Chilean awakening, means for us here in California and in the USA. So stay tuned for our Terra Verde program today as our guest Cynthia Ammerman has some fascinating insights to share with us about the links between Chile and California. First, though, before we really get started, I would like to communicate to listeners that those of us in the Terra Verde Collective are very appreciative and thankful for all of the listener support for KPFA. It is very much an honor to be here as community radio volunteers when the support of the community is so committed and generous. On behalf of our entire collective of Terra Verde program hosts, I also want to say thanks to all of the KPFA staff and volunteers that make it possible for Terra Verde to be on the air on a weekly basis. Our team will continue to work hard this year, bringing listeners volunteer-powered news and insights about environmental protection and related social justice issues here in the San Francisco Bay Area, across the state and the nation, and indeed around the world. We truly believe in the power of community radio, and we know you do too. Your support makes the difference. Please do be sure to take advantage of the easy options for donating and supporting KPFA Radio by going to kpfa.org and following the Donate button at the top of the page. Remember, community radio truly gets the goods now more than ever. So as we head into the main substance of our show, I want to express thanks and appreciation to our guest today, Cynthia Ammerman from the Native American Studies Department at UC Davis. Cynthia, thanks so much for making the effort to join me on KPFA Terra Verde. How are you doing today? I'm doing great, Gary. Thank you for having me on the show. Well, I am really excited to have you here. And I also want to thank all the KPFA listeners who are tuned in to Terra Verde. I'm very glad to be on the air and contributing to California Community Radio. Y también mandamos un saludo muy especial a todos los compañeros en Chile y Walmapu que están escuchando de repente en el internet. We'll definitely be sharing this archive. We're so excited to have you on Terra Verde, Cynthia. We've had the chance over the past year to do some excellent episodes in which we've been able to really focus on current events in Chile. And we've really looked at the estallido social and the social explosion and all of the ongoing process around the development of a new constitution to replace this constitution originating in the Pinochet military regime. And we've also extensively covered some of the major issues that people in California and the USA should be aware of, for instance, around the massive expansion of the exotic tree species monoculture plantation model for the pulp, paper, and biomass sector. So we have so much to cover. Having you on the show to get further into what is happening in Chile is a very special opportunity. Um, Maybe we should just go ahead and get started, though, before throwing ourselves completely into this shared history of Chile and California that you're studying. Let's give listeners a bit of an introduction. Can you tell us about yourself and your journey 
to being a researcher yes. and writer? Yeah, I'm happy to. Um, I just want to say, Mari Mari Compuche, aquí estamos en solidaridad desde California. Um, I'm from Walmapu, ancestral Mapuche territory in present day southern Chile. And um, it's also known as the Araucanía or the ninth region of Chile. I moved to California about 10 years ago. I got my master's in community development at UC Davis, and I'm still here. Um, now I'm working on my PhD in Native American studies at UC Davis. <laughs> So I came to this research um, mainly through personal concern. Every time I travel to the countryside to visit my family in the South, um, the land looked really, really different. And um, often when I'm there, my grandfather and I will drive to the place where he grew up. And he always points out that the native forest that covered those hills um, has been replaced with monoculture trees. And he has also noticed that bird species are disappearing, um, water's also disappearing. The, the big river that runs by my hometown, El Rio Tolten, um, it dries up to a trickle in some parts over the summer. And that's, that's unheard of. Um, that's a really recent thing. When I was little, I remember looking at the river and it was just so wide, you could barely see the other bank. Um, so yeah, this is all a relatively new issue that has developed as a result of the extensive pine and eucalyptus monoculture. I'm so glad to have you here. Uh, the, you know, the picture that you're painting is really uh, very moving. You know, the, you know, really sensing the loss um, when we see the native ecosystems replaced uh, with these monoculture pines. Uh, your focus right now is on Chile, but I also want to make sure listeners know a little bit about some of the other projects that you've worked on that really look at these questions of indigenous justice when we're confronting a climate crisis. Uh, for instance, you did some mapping in support of communities in Standing Rock that were fighting against the Dakota Access Pipeline. That seems like a really interesting project. Could you tell us a little bit about that work? Before I get into that, though, I just want to mention that my department at UC Davis, uh, Native American Studies, is really unique in that it focuses on accountability to Indigenous communities and hemispheric unity and interdisciplinarity. And that's part of the reason why I was able to get into all these other projects throughout the hemisphere, really. Um, so the Standing Rock Mapping Project um, is a map I collaborated on with cartographer Molly Roy and my colleagues Jessa Ray Growing Thunder, Mike Mortimer, and my advisor Liza Grandia. And we created it in 2016 at the height of the Dakota Access Pipeline conflict. We, we really wanted to contextualize the dabble threat within a history of genocide and dispossession. Um, and it became an educational tool in the classroom, in workshops, in teachings, um, and uh, it, you can find it, um, I think, at the UC Berkeley Library website. And it was also published under um, the Water Atlas, um, the Guerrilla Cartography Water Atlas. Well, that is so fascinating. And then also you've done some work with communities in Guatemala that were actually displaced, if I understand it correctly, during the military offenses of the Civil War. Uh, can you tell us a little bit uh, more about your work with those communities as they strive to um, resecure a land base and to confront environmental injustices? Sure. I also became um, engaged in that project because of my advisor. Um, she has been working with them for decades. <laughs> Um, over the past year, I have provided technical support. I built a website for them, uh, made some videos um, for um, their Akechi Maya community organization in El Petén, Guatemala, in the northern lowlands. And among their many projects, they support cultural and territorial reclamation. So they're educating rural communities on their legal rights so that they can defend themselves against threats from corporate landholders like palm plantations. And palm is a major issue in Guatemala. What kind of environmental you know, threats are the communities confronting when they're dealing with these plantations? Um, all kinds. Um, while I was there, um, a river, one of the uh, palm plantations dumped a bunch of pesticides um, into a river and it 
tons of fish washed up on the shores. Um, this is a river where people bathe, where they wash their clothes. Um, it's just, it's, it's really tragic. Um, and they're also uh, facing threats from narco traffickers. They're facing threats from cattle ranchers. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a difficult place to be in, but this um, organization is really just doing an amazing work organizing the communities. Well, we will definitely continue to take this conversation specifically to your research um, uh, about Chile, what's happening in Chile and these ties that bind Chile and California. But with your experience in diverse communities uh, across the continent, really, I'd, I'd like to ask you about what are the dynamics that are shared amongst these communities? And then, you know, how is it that you identify that each case is totally unique. Can you do a little bit of compare and contrast for us about these dynamics that indigenous communities across the Americas are confronting? Um, I would definitely say each case is very unique um, because indigenous communities have developed distinct cultures and practices in relationship to their particular territories. Um, there's enormous diversity uh, throughout the Americas, and, and this is part of the strength of indigenous movements. But the threats that people face are really similar. And um, I think in particular, I would say, is the policing tactics uh, used to repress land defenders. They, they are strikingly similar across the Americas. Um, with regards to Chile and California, they share really similar struggles around water scarcity, native forest lost and, and wildfires, which I'm just beginning to look at now. And that's because, uh, partly because our regions share really similar geomorphology and climate and vegetation. So um, you could say that they're, these regions are mirror images of each other. Some people also call, call us trans-hemispheric twins. If you turn Chile upside down, you will see that the geography resembles that of the west coast of the U.S., I, I think it's really organic how you flowed um, into this main subject of our interview, uh, really looking at the ties between Chile and California. And I think it's really interesting and important to elevate this uh, kind of geographical mirror that is offered as well. Uh, I mean, Chile, of course, being a long, thin country, is, is, has a much longer coastline. In California, I guess I, I look at sometimes if you could imagine a country that ran from the tip of the Baja Peninsula all the way up to the Aleutians, but was just this narrow band all along the coast, that would be, in essence, what Chile is to the South American continent here in North America. But it's really fascinating to think about these parallels. Can you go in that into that a little bit more? How Chile and California are this, um, you know, distinct, very unique, but in some ways biogeographical mirrors. Yeah. So both regions are bordered by the Pacific Ocean and by mountain ranges. So we have the Sierra Nevadas up here, and then we have the Andes in in Chile. Um, Southern Chile and the uppermost part of Northern California have temperate rainforest. And on the other extreme, uh, we both have deserts. Um, both places also share similar fertile central valleys where agriculture is concentrated. And both regions also have Mediterranean type regions. And we both have uh, biodiversity hotspots. And lastly, we both share a significant number of alien plants. Um, I think it's something like 500 uh, species that we share in Chile and California. That's right. One of the greatest threats to biodiversity in both places after and related to extractive industries activities, though, is this issue of invasive species and how they're totally uh, changing the landscape and um, having uh, tremendous impacts on evolutionary processes. I think that's a really important I never bring up, and actually, that goes straight to the you know focus of your study on the monoculture plantations because we have this issue of you know uh, invasive species spreading of their own will distributing, but then also we have these instances of the intentional um, you know economical 
you know, utilitarian focus on the use of exotic species. Um, we will get more into the plantation stuff, but I I thought we would still step back a little bit. Then you've you've looked so much at the connections between Chile and California in terms of being a mirror of each other in a biological sense or an ecological sense, but then the history, this is what you've really been getting into, Cynthia, and uh, I think this is really fascinating. Do you know, can, can we really start to uh, get into a little bit of this nuts and bolts of the way that the histories of California and Chile are so closely intertwined? What I'm interested in is the interconnected colonization between my home region, the Araucanía, and California Indian Territory during the gold rush and how these links created the conditions for the exploitative industry we now have in Chile. Some of the first gold prospectors to arrive in California during the gold rush were uh, Chilean. That's because the sea route from Chile to San Francisco was a lot safer and faster than Atlantic travel or uh, coming from across the continent. Um, by some accounts, there were like 8,000 Chileans here by the mid um, 1850s. And they brought with them extensive mining knowledge because Chileans had mines um, in the north of the country. And they um, brought labor. They and, and one of the main things that I focus on is that they brought uh, wheat, grain, and flour, something like 73,000 tons of uh, flour during that time. So in no small part, Chileans were responsible for fueling the colonization of California. Chileans also introduced a hardy club wheat variety that has been credited with jumpstarting California's agricultural economy. Um, so at this time, uh, because Chile was providing so much wheat to California for the gold rush, there was an agricultural boom in Chile. And um, it drove Chilean settlers into Mapuche territory in search for farmland. So I, I want to back up for a second um, to explain that Mapuche are the only indigenous people to have defeated the Spanish and to have their territorial sovereignty recognized. It wasn't until the mid to late 1800s that Chileans were able to colonize Mapuche territory. And, and part of the success was due to this, to mass deforestation that took place as settlers burned and cleared the land to grow wheat and other cereal crops and to settle. Um, so Chileans were absolutely inspired by uh, California's colonization, so much so that newspapers of the time claimed that um, they were going to conquer the Araucanía and that in its place a new California would rise. And in fact, one of the drivers um, of this mentality was um, a person, a gold prospector that came back from California to Chile, became an agent of colonization upon his return. And I think his name is Vicente Perez Rosales. And I think that he was really influenced by John Sutter. Because in his diary, he sings him praises and claims that Sutter has um, established the first model colony in the western part of the American continent. So uh, Vicente Perez Rosales returns to Chile, becomes an agent of colonization, and ignites one of the first massive forest fires on the frontier with Mapuche territory. It's, it was a fire that burned for three months. And all that cleared land was then deeded to settlers. That is such an incredible connection for us to be exploring here on Terra Verde on KPFA 94.1 FM. My name is Gary Hughes. I'm your host. And we are hearing from Cynthia Ammerman from the Native American Studies Department at UC Davis. And we've been steadily moving into the heart of Cynthia's research, uh, exploring these connections between Chile and California. And we've still got about 10 minutes left, Cynthia. So let's keep going with this. You were just telling us the story about Vicente Perez Rosales returning to Chile uh, to, to 
I mean, I, I don't want to be crude, but to Californicate Chile, it's kind of, it, I mean, tell us more about uh, how this went on because also at this point in time, let's, let's, let's make sure I'm understanding the timeline correctly. Let's say, for instance, 1849, you know, we talk about the 49ers in California and the gold rush is, is launched here and the genocide begins in California. 1849, though, the Araucanía, South of the Bio Bio River in Chile, this was Mapuche territory. It was recognized Mapuche territory. It was their own nation. Do I have that totally correct? Yes, that's correct. And so let's go on to this a bit more then about people like Vicente Perez Rosales returning uh, from their uh, you know uh, adventures in California with with this frontier mentality. Um, another. Um, gold prospector that came back from California um, to Chile. His name is Vicuña Maquena. He brought the idea that there was gold in the Araucanía. And he published this idea in several newspapers. And so it got people fueled up, like we need to get into the Araucanía to uh, get the gold, to get our agricultural uh, lands. And, um, and, and, Part of how they were able to conquer it was through just mass deforestation and displacing um, Mapuche peoples, forming large estates. And um, the, the results of this massive deforestation that took place created, obviously, immense ecological damage and soil erosion. So um, by the time they had conquered Mapuche territory in the late 1800s, um, they started noticing the effects of what they had done. And they began to reforest with the California native Monterey pine, um, otherwise known as radiata pine, to, to combat the soil erosion. And that's basically the precursor, and that was one of the early justifications that was used for planting the exotic species was to um, manage soil erosion. But with time, then this model really just exploded. I mean, can you can you maybe take us through a little bit of the history? Then? Because the Monterey pine as a as a displaced species is is really um, one of the most important elements of your recent research. Yeah, um, it actually arrived through England, the first seeds. Um, and um, it was a German forester. So Chile brought in a German forester to solve the soil erosion problem. And by then, Monterey pine was already being grown there, I believe, as um, in, in somebody's private gardens. Um, but this German forester, Federico Albert, um, identified it as, as something that could could help with the soil erosion. And um, that's when they started planting it. It wasn't until the, sorry, I'm going to fast forward to the 70s until it was um, extensively planted. And this was in large part due to, well, not in large part, primarily because um, Pinochet, uh, a military dictatorship that introduced neoliberal reforms, um, he heavily subsidized timber companies. So he took a lot of the land that our socialist president had given to Mapuche. He expropriated that land and um, gave it to uh, private landholders, um, timber companies, and then subsidized their um their cost at 70 to 80 percent in some cases. Subsidize the cost of planting the, the exotic species. Yes, of, of operations, yeah. And so now, um, starting in the 70s, we have this uh, so-called green rush of pine plantations that are steadily taking over the south central regions of the country. And this is really closely tied then to the privatization of a, a, a nascent but existing pulp industry and then those privatizations gave these economic interests assets that they're able to leverage into expanding the pulp and paper infrastructure as well right and mm -hmm. so you've looked a little you've looked into the industrial aspects of this but um the monterey pines spread across the landscape has been a, a great focus of yours. Um, and I think we've made some hints to the ecological damage from this, but you've also been looking at the cultural 
issues. So can, can you describe the Monterey pine not only as an ecological uh, invasive species, uh, but can you talk about Monterey pine as, as a colonizer more? Yeah, um, it's, it's really interesting to see how in its native habitat in coastal California, the Monterey pine is now endangered. And um, it used to be a source of food and medicine for Ohlone people. Um, the low intensity fires were lit under it so that its cones would open and the heat would release the, the pine nuts. Um, the tree is a pyrophyte, so it needs that fire to reproduce. Um, but now, um, well, and also, I'm just, I want to paint an image for for the listeners. The n- the tree grows really differently in the, in the native habitat um, than in, it does in Chile. Um, if you see it out here, it's just so unique and beautiful. Often uh, it's crooked due to the winds coming in from the ocean. The branches stretch out in every direction. It's not super tall uh, like it grows in Chile. Um, so as, as a monoculture, um, it grows really, really straight. It uh, grows really uniformly and it grows very fast in Chile, much faster than it does in California. It really, um, when you look at the plantations, it resembles rows of soldiers as a Mapuche poet pointed out. So through no fault of its own, this, this pine has now become synonymous with a military dictatorship, with neoliberalism, with colonization. Um, because uh, this pine behaves like a colonizer in Chile, it renders the land unhospitable to the native species. And I think um, everyone should be really attentive to what is happening in Chile right now um, because it was a laboratory for a neoliberal model and a forestry model, which was replicated throughout Latin America. I'm interested in seeing how this new constitution that has come out of the uh, popular uprising and the policies that will emerge from it um, will address inequality and um and uh, native sovereignty. So I'm hopeful that this may also inspire other people throughout the world. Oh yeah, thank you so much, Cynthia. This has been great. We just barely scraped the surface, but what you have shared with us today is really super valuable. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks again. And thanks to the listeners for joining us. That brings us to the end of our Terra Verde program for today. Thanks so much to everyone who tuned in. A big thanks to Cynthia Ammerman from the Native American Studies Department at UC Davis for joining us today on Terra Verde. And I also want to give a special thanks to technical staff and our engineers. Without them, this unique KPFA programming would not be possible. Remember, you can listen to the archives of this show and others on kpfa.org. We hope you can join us next Friday at 2 p.m. for Terra Verde. Enjoy your afternoon. Pray for rain and snow and have a great weekend. Mandala Radio Collective for a very special day of programming as we celebrate the Roaring Twenties. For Black History Month, the Harlem Renaissance, the Great Migration, Black Wall Street, and the most notable blues and jazz artists, poets, writers, and thinkers of that time. That's Saturday, February 6th from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. right here on 94.1 FM, KPFA. KPFA is America's original, listener-supported radio station. Yes, we're the place on the dial that speaks truth to power, but we're also a music discovery platform. Music is part of the genetics of KPFA. We connect Bay Area music lovers to genres that inspire creativity. Help us continue to share the magic of jazz, blues, rock, funk, R&B, gospel, world, and classical music by making a donation at kpfa.org.